Perfect. So welcome everyone to today's virtual market design seminar. Um, before introducing our speaker, let me quickly remind you of our seminar rules. So if you have a question, please write it to the chat. Um, during the breaks, you have then the chance to unmute yourself and um, ask this question. Uh, please be aware that we are um, recording this session and will later upload it to YouTube. So if you don't want to appear uh, on the video, please do not speak up. Uh, now it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome our presenter, Eric Budich. Um, Eric is a professor at Chicago. He's a true market design expert and worked on all kinds of market design topics. Today, he will talk to us about the economic limits of Bitcoin and the blockchain. So dear Eric, the floor is yours. We are very much looking forward to your talk. Well, th thanks very much for having me. As I was saying before we got started, this has been one of the, the silver linings of the last 12 months is the opportunity to do events like this one and get to interact you know, virtually. So it's not quite the same, but with, with economists from, uh, from all over the world. I'm really glad to, really glad to do it. Um, and you can all see my screen just fine. And oh, there's a, I think that's one problem with the screen. We, we see your, uh, yeah, now see it's me. Okay, now, now is it good? Oh, good. I was Perfect. looking... Right. Okay. So this is a paper that I first circulated in June of 2018. And I'll give the, I'm going to basically present the paper as written then with a, with a few small updates. It's something I've been revisiting um, just given the current level of interest in, in Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and um, just <laughs> essentially want to re restate the argument. I think the argument still holds up. Uh, as, I'll, as I'll explain and uh, give, give you a, a modest update on my thinking, but uh, basically present the paper as written in, in June 2018. And, and um, I'm looking, looking forward to, uh, to your feedback. Um, so this is a paper that makes an argument and I wanna spend the first slide just giving you, uh, giving you the argument. Um, the argument is, so Satoshi Nakamoto, the inventor of Bitcoin uh, what he or she or they invented from a computer science perspective is a new form of trust and specifically a way, a novel way of generating anonymous decentralized trust uh, in a data set. Uh, and this is from an in innovation called the proof of work or the Nakamoto blockchain or the proof of work blockchain. Those are all different phrases for the same thing. Uh, the amount of computational work devoted to maintaining this novel form of trust uh, has to simultaneously satisfy two equations. The first equation is a standard economic free entry condition, a zero profits condition uh, for the maintainers of the trust, the, the blockchain uh, miners. And for those of you for whom this, this um, the jargon is confusing. I'll go over in, in detail in a few slides. And then second is an in incentive compatibility condition. So the, the, the Achilles heel of Nakamoto's novel form of trust is that it's vulnerable to what's called a majority attack or a 51% attack. So zero profits condition and an incentive compatibility condition. Um, the issue is that together these two conditions imply a third one which is that the recurring payments to blockchain miners for maintaining the trust have to be large relative to the value of attacking the thing, relative to the one-off stock-like benefits uh, of attacking the blockchain. So the flow cost of maintaining the trust has to be large relative to the, the stock-like benefits of, of violating or breaking the trust. And this is just very expensive. It's a, it's a new form of trust, but it's a very, very expensive form of trust. And I'll argue you can think of it as like a large implicit tax on using the Nakamoto blockchain uh, in economically useful ways, whether it's you know, buying, a, buying a latte or a cappuccino or, or sending millions of dollars of value around the global financial system. The way out of this argument, and again, it's a, it's a three equation argument that's skeptical of something with trillion, uh, literally a trillion dollars of market capitalization. 
The way out of this argument and the reason why I think Bitcoin hasn't already been majority attacked is, is two conditions. Uh, so number one, if the technology used to maintain Bitcoin is specialized to Bitcoin, and it is, it, uh, Bitcoin is currently maintained using sophisticated, uh, using specialized computers that are really only useful for Bitcoin mining, one. And two, any attack of the system, we should think of as like a sabotage. So not just stealing some money, but actually uh, causing the whole edifice of trust to, uh, to fall apart. So what I'll call sabotage. Uh, this combination of two factors, specialized technology and sabotage, uh, is enough to, to enable the Bitcoin method of trust to work without being quite as expensive. But this, this relies on a, on a major concession, which is vulnerability to, to, to sabotage and collapse. And the analysis, as you'll see, points to some specific uh, collapse scenarios. So the overall take that comes out of this paper is I, I, I do genuinely think the Nakamoto blockchain is, is an ingenious invention. It invented a form of trust that hadn't existed before. Uh, but I'll, I'll argue it's, it's economically somewhat, uh, somewhat limited. Um, the disclaimer, it's, it's the reason I'm giving this paper now, um, have, having kind of let it, let it lie dormant for a couple of years, is just the, the renewed interest in uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies has been off the charts lately. Uh, here's, a, here's a price chart. Um, the market capitalization now exceeds a trillion dollars. And this was after I, I kind of circulated the paper around here and there was Bitcoin had seemed like it was in slow gradual decline. I'd made my case to um, the economics profession, to uh, financial markets regulators. I felt like I'd said my piece, uh, but there's now a, 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 a surge of renewed interest in, in Bitcoin. Um, and I, I want to just give a disclaimer at the outset. I do not have an explanation for why Bitcoin's current asset value is you know, $60,000 or about a trillion dollars of market cap. Um, what I am gonna argue and, and what my paper shows is that Bitcoin's economic usefulness is likely to continue to be limited. Um, it's natural to conjecture that low usefulness implies low asset value, but the, you know, these are separable. Also confusing and something I don't have a lot to say about is that a large majority of the recent volume is on uh, crypto exchanges. So like Coinbase or Binance. Um, this is not the anonymous decentralized trust that's in, that was invented by Nakamoto. In, instead, a lot, of, a lot of US investors in Bitcoin, for example, seem to be trusting the combination of Coinbase and rule of law instead of trusting the combination of you know, JP Morgan and the rule of law. It's, it seems mostly speculative. I don't get it, but it's a separate issue from, from my paper, which is about economic usefulness. Um, and to date, the claim that Bitcoin's economic usefulness is limited is, is still looking pretty good, despite the trillion dollars of, of market cap. Okay, so let me spend three slides uh, going over um, what is the Nakamoto blockchain. And for those of you who are, are deep in cryptocurrencies, this will all be review and you'll find it insulting and, and want to want to call me names. But for those of you who haven't uh, haven't seen this before, I think it can be a very very helpful, quick uh, summary of the invention. So the tr a transaction, uh, the, the, the unit, I want you to think in terms of the unit of, uh, uh, let, me, let me say that again, a, a, key, a key unit is a transaction. A transaction consists of a sender, a receiver, an amount, and a signature. Um, and the signature, so this is like Eric sends Nicholas a Bitcoin signed by Eric. Um, the signature uses uh, standard cryptography techniques, so not, not novel to cryptography, but, but standard, uh, standard to cryptography, uh, basically public-private key stuff that proves the sender's identity, proves that Eric is Eric, and also encodes the transaction details. You can picture this as like a check where you've signed your name over the amount, uh, amount of the transaction, the one Bitcoin, so that the, the amount can't be altered after the fact. But this is all using standard cryptography, nothing new. 
Imagine we accumulated, you know, we invent Buddhist coin and we start accumulating these kinds of transactions, sender, receiver, amount, signature on a Google doc, on a, on a Google spreadsheet. The cryptographic signature adds a, already a certain amount of, of protection, right? If there's, a if there's a transaction signed by Eric, only Eric could have originated it or someone with, you know, Eric's password. Um, but a, a Google spreadsheet would be vulnerable to the following kinds of uh, issues. I could send money I don't have, so I could create a transaction where I send Nicholas a Bitcoin, but I don't have that Bitcoin. I could send money I do have, but to multiple parties at the same time, uh, or I could delete uh, delete previous transactions, mine or, or others. Um, so a Google spreadsheet kind of doesn't doesn't work, despite the fact that the cryptographic signatures uh, give a certain level of security. Now let's imagine we accumulate transactions through a trusted party like a bank that keeps track of the balances. It keeps track of if, if I send a Bitcoin to Nicholas, do I have that Bitcoin in fact? And that, that works just fine regarding all three of these uh, security issues that I listed, but it requires a trusted party like a bank. And the whole point of the Nakamoto blockchain is to get around the need for, uh, for a trusted party. Okay, so what did, what did Nakamoto uh, invent? Um, users submit transactions to, to like a holding tank. So think of this as like a Google Doc, a pending transactions list. And then this, this large mass of compute power called uh, miners uh, competes for the right to validate a block of transactions from the pending transactions list into the, the main official record called the blockchain. Um, each new block of transactions uh, chains to the previous block. I'll give you a visual of this in a slide. This is where the phrase blockchain comes from. Um, and for a block of transactions to be valid, each individual transaction has to be properly signed. So if Eric sends a Bitcoin to Nicholas, it was signed by Eric. Um, it's got to be funded given history. So I, if I send a Bitcoin to Nicholas this period, I must have had it last period and before. And then there can't be contradictions. I can't send the same money to two different parties in the same block. So let me show you a picture of this. Here's a, a, a visual of a block. These are individual transactions. Again, each transaction is sender, receiver, amount, signature. That's it. Um, there's some cryptographic details that, um, of, of, uh, of these transactions down here. And then the connection of one, one block of transactions to the previous block of transactions uh, is through a hash function. So this block of transactions would include a hash of all of the data from the previous blocks. So you can you can tell what what the or, what the sequencing is of, of transactions. So validity is each individual transaction is correctly signed. It's that each individual transaction is funded given history. So if transaction one is me sending Nicholas a buck. I have a buck from this history. And then no contradictions. So track transactions one and two don't contradict each other. I'm not sending the same money to two, two different parties. Okay, so this computational tournament, that's the part I haven't described yet. Think of this as a large brute force search for a lucky number. Um, it's for a lucky hash, so a, a essentially random alphanumeric string. It's a function of the new block and the previous data it's chaining to. Um, and without getting into the details of this, the, the key feature of it is that it's hard to find, easy to check. The Bitcoin system is currently checking about 150 million trillion uh, lucky random numbers per second. Again, 150 million trillion um, hashes per second. And what you're doing is you're, you're checking um, if, if this hash combined with all of the data spits out a, an output that's got a large number of zeros at the front of it. But it's basically just brute force search for a lucky random number. And again, 150 million trillion per second. The miner who finds such a lucky hash reports, re, gets to report the block. Um, other miners can then check the validity of this block and then start working on the next one. And the incentive to do this 150 million trillion computations per second is you get paid. You get paid currently of six and a quarter bitcoins plus fees worth about four hundred thousand uh, bucks. So that that's that's the the payment that incentivizes this large mass of computational power. 
Um, okay, so here's Nakamoto's summary from the abstract of the Nakamoto paper of what, what this system, what this elaborate system invents. Um, you can think of this as a, a system of time stamping. So the network time stamps transactions by hashing them into an ongoing chain of hash based proof of work forming a record that can't be changed without redoing all of the work, without redoing the proof of work. Um, the longest chain serves not only as the proof of the se sequence of events witnessed, but proof that it came from the largest pool of computer power. So to do 150 million trillion computations per second, you gotta have a lot of compute power. Um, and then here's from the abstract, as long as a majority of the computer power is controlled by nodes that are not cooperating to attack the network, They'll generate the longest chain and outpace attackers. Um, so anonymous decentralized trust, right? This elaborate system creates a way for Eric to send a Bitcoin to Nicholas without going through a bank. Um, the, the, the 150 million trillion hashes per second are generating trust that I'm not sending the same money to two different parties and that I'm not gonna attack the thing. But the vulnerability is, um, is it requires that a majority of the computer power is, is behaving honestly. Um, and this is in the, in the Nakamoto abstract, not something I made up. Okay, so just a clarification, as, intro, as interest in Bitcoin and its blockchain have surged, um, the phrase blockchain has started to take on multiple meanings, including the use of distributed databases among known trusted parties. Uh, so here's a great Matt Levine quote. He says, if you announce that you're updating the database software used by a consortium of banks to track derivatives trades, the New York Times will not write an article about it. If you say that you're blockchaining the blockchain software used by a blockchain of blockchains to blockchain, blockchain, blockchains, the New York Times will blockchain a blockchain about it, uh, which uh, Matt Levine's very good. Um, so my, my critique is of blockchain in the sense of Nakamoto, not of distributed databases, which seem quite, quite useful and non-controversial. All right, so here, here's a schematic of the paper. Uh, and I'll go through this slide's outline and then pause and see if there are any, any initial questions. But the, fir the first part of the paper is gonna go through this critique I alluded to on the first slide, where it's really three equations, a rent seeking you know, zero profit equation for miners, an incentive compatibility equation that the system not induce majority attack, and then put these two equations together and you get the key economic limit on Bitcoin and the blockchain, which is this flow versus stock idea. The flow cost of maintaining the trust has to be large relative to the value of attacking the system. The second part of the paper is I'll go through some majority attack scenarios. And the two I'll focus on are number one, double spending. This was the motivating um, issue uh, that Nakamoto was, was trying to solve. Um, and the, the, the key, really the issue uh, the issue that Nakamoto solved that hadn't been solved before is how to not allow double spending in a, in a, a cryptocurrency essentially. And then second, uh, a sabotage attack. So an attack whose purpose is not to get goods and services for free, but actually to bring down the system. And then the third, the last part of the paper is I'll talk about this sabotage attack more fully uh, in the context of the current technology used to solve these computational puzzles which is very Bitcoin specific. And I'll go through how this yields a softer constraint that's more like stock versus stock, not flow versus stock. Um, but for this to work, you're conceding the possibility of a sabotage attack. And then this in turn points to some potential collapse scenarios. Um, so let me pause here. I see there might be a couple of questions in the chat and let me give the floor to, to Nicholas or one of the organizers and just um, let's, let's take some questions and I'll go on. Yeah, perfect. You're right. Thank there you. are some questions. Uh, I think Noah has the first question. So Noah, please. Oh yeah, I was going to ask, as you uh, said, you assume a no profit condition and so on. Are you going to assume we are in equilibrium with this? Because my impression is there's a lot of change happening to that. Um, so what is your thoughts about that? Yeah, so it's, it's a very good question. Um, so the, the equation will assume equilibrium. So the equation is, assumes zero profit equilibrium. But I think, I think that that's reasonably economically robust in the sense that if you award $400,000 per 10 minutes for solving a computational riddle, our intuition should be that a, 
on the order of $400,000 per 10 minutes should get invested in trying to win the prize. And if it's 300,000, there'll be a little bit, there'll be an incentive to enter. If there's 500,000, there'll be an incentive to exit. So there's, there's, there's gonna be constant re-equilibration to your point, but as, a, as an order of magnitude for what level of compute power do we expect in the system, zero profit is, a, is a, I think a useful way to, to conceptualize it. Perfect. Um, I think Naomi has the next question. Uh, I think my question may have actually been answered by uh, Willaum. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, but I was wondering, apparently there's some transaction fees associated to mining, but I've heard there's like an upper limit on the number of Bitcoins, some like number of million. Yes. And like, will that lead to some sort of collapse? Willaum so says I that maybe the transaction fees are enough, but like what, what's going to happen to this system? Yeah, so great question. So let me say two quick things. So one is um, um, the so the current the current reward to a miner for winning one of these computational tournaments is six and a quarter bitcoins, and that amount halves every every certain amount of time, and it will well, actually go all the way to zero in the year twenty one forty. So I actually gave um I did some webinar on Bitcoin, maybe in June or so. And someone asked me, like, do you have a prediction for the Bitcoin price? And I, I, I feel okay about, I mean, it's on the right, on YouTube somewhere, but I said, um, you know, I don't, I genuinely don't have a prediction over the next several years, but I do predict that by 2140, it'll be zero. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a long time from now. But the, the reasoning there is that once there stops being, um, a reward of new Bitcoin, then to incentivize miners, you have to pay them with fees. And then my colleague, Jacob Leshno has done this really interesting paper on the economics of that, which is if you're only paying the miners using um, fees, meaning Eric pays Nicholas one Bitcoin, but also gives like a tip to the miners for adding his transaction, that, that way of inducing, um, uh, of, of inducing trust has some stability problems that Lesh, it's a paper by Leshno and uh, Huberman and uh, Moalami uh, Moa maybe. It was a, so it's a very nice paper. I think it's coming out in Restud. Um, that's the kind of the, the two part answer to your question. Perfect. Okay, so I think these were the questions. Great, so let me, let me press forward. Um, okay, so First equation is the zero profit condition for miners or rent seeking competition. So let's, let's call P block the economic reward to the miner that wins the computational tournament. Um, and I'm gonna assume this is exogenous. The last question was about how this reward actually varies over time as the, you know, right now it's six and a quarter Bitcoins plus fees, but in 2140, it'll be zero Bitcoins plus fees. Early on it was 50 Bitcoins plus fees. But I'm gonna assume this is exogenous for now. Um, little c, I'm going to call the per block cost of one unit of compute power. Um, and notationally, I think it's easiest to think of this as something like little c equals a rental cost of capital. So I'm using a computer. This is like the 10 minute cost of a computer. So the short r is like the short, the, the 10 minute rental cost of a computer, um, plus some flow cost of electricity or some some per, per computer unit, compute unit cost of electricity, a uh, little e. But really just C is like the cost of one lotto ticket in the, the lottery for winning, a, winning the prize. Um, let's assume for now that the capital is easily repurposable. And this is, this is false for Bitcoin at present. And the, 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 sec, the last part of the paper will go through this in detail. Uh, but it does capture the Nakamoto vision of one CPU, one vote, um, and I'll, I'll come back to it. Because once it's false, if you also add the sabotage issue, then you can restore a form of trust, but conceding, conceding sabotage. Um, OK, so if there are n units of computational power, each unit has a one out of n chance of, of winning the prize of, of p blocks, you get a free entry condition uh, as such, where n star times C, so n units of compute, compute power times the cost per unit equals the prize uh, in the computational tournament. And this is the, the zero profit uh, question I was talking about 
uh, with Nora. This equation is widely known. It's probably in at least half a dozen economics papers. It's in English on the Bitcoin Wiki. This is not novel to, to my paper by any stretch. Um, it's well known, so set, building into the second equation, it's well known that the blockchain is vulnerable to majority attack. This is from the abstract of the Nakamoto paper. I read this to you earlier. Let me reread that last sentence. As long as a majority of compute power is controlled by nodes that are not cooperating to attack the network, they'll generate the longest chain and outpace attackers. Um, Bitcoin security model relies on no one control in more than half. Um, so what is the cost of a majority attack? Uh, well, if I'm an outsider, the cost of a, of a majority is n star times c um, plus, you know, plus an epsilon. So I gotta have a little bit more compute power than the honest, uh, honest miners. An inside attacker could have as little as half of that. Um, I'll use the notion of an A majority. So uh, an at outside attacker with A over A plus one of the total compute system, that costs A times N star, N star C. So if A is like two, for example, that means I have twice as much compute power as the honest miners yielding me a two thirds majority. That costs me A times N star C per, per unit time. Let's assume that there exists an attack with a payoff capital V that takes an A attacker T time. Um, and I'll simulate uh, A and T uh, in a moment. Uh, and I'll also discuss the, the, the payoff in a moment. Um, this yields an equation for the cost of an attack net of the block rewards as follows. And uh, this equation has a conservatism in it that I'll describe in a moment. Um, the cost of the attack is, well, the A attacker takes T time costing A T times N star C, but the attacker is getting compensated for their attack in the form of block rewards. And I'm gonna assume for now that if it takes T times, if it takes six blocks, I earn six block rewards. Um, and this is actually conservative because an A attacker would, would earn more than that. I'll come back to this in a, in a few slides. Um, Using the first equation and then defining this constant alpha of A minus one times T, um, the cost of attack, the net cost of attack is alpha units of this N star C. Uh, alpha units of, of this compute cost, per, zero profit uh, compute cost per unit time. Um, so alpha N star C has got to be bigger than the value of attacking the system to not incentivize uh, a majority attack. All right, so the problem is, let's, look, let's stare at these two equations. So the first equation is zero profit condition. If you pay $400,000 per 10 minutes, you're gonna get $400,000 per 10 minutes of compute power. The second, the second equation says, well, you better be paying enough to not induce an attack. If you're paying $400,000 per 10 minutes, and the net cost of attack is alpha units of this compute, of compute power, that better be large relative to the value of an attack. Um, so N star C shows up in both, both equation one and two. You string these two together, you get a third equation where P block, the payment per 10 minutes of attack in the system, uh, uh, to the miners has got to be larger than V over, over alpha, the net cost of attack. And in, in words, what this says is the equilibrium payment to miners per block um, has got to be large relative to the one-off benefits of attacking the system. Uh, so I'll, I'll parameter, I'll, I'll compute alpha in simulations. It's pretty small. Um, so the, the flow payment to miners has got to be large relative to the value of an attack, which you can think of as more like a stock. Um, so let me make two remarks on this, on this equation. So first is an economics remark, um, which is this, this is just a very expensive form of trust. Again, the flow cost of the trust has got to be large relative to the stock value of breaking the trust. And a way of thinking about what makes it so expensive is it's extremely memoryless, right? Usually trust has memory to it. Here, the system is only secure as secure as the amount of compute power this 10 minutes and next 10 minutes. The, the fact that Starbucks has been building a brand for 40 years and that that creates trust in Starbucks 
That's absent from this model of trust. The fact that JP Morgan is backed by the rule of law and also backed by you know, hundreds of years of, uh, of giving you your money back when you ask for it, that's absent from this form of trust. It's very memoryless. Um, so usual alternatives, relationships, brands, rule of law. The, the, I also wanna make a security point, which is it's a very linear security model. If the value of an attack goes up by a thousand times, the cost you need to pay the miners to not incentivize attack has to go up a thousand times. If it goes up a million times, the cost of paying the miners has to go up a million times. What's the usual security model? The usual security models are not linear. They're usually cryptography, force, or rule of law, where you pay something like a fixed cost to provide a large level of, of, of security. Um, this, this security model is extremely linear, and that's a way of thinking about where its vulnerability comes from. Again, a billion dollar attack is a thousand times more expensive to prevent than a million dollar attack. Okay, so let me go into what these attacks uh, look like, because I imagine it's somewhat, seems a little bit abstract. And I want to spend most of my time thinking about what's called a double spending attack. This is really the motivating issue in the... Um, uh, cryptocurrency literature that Nakamoto's inventions solved um, you know, to, to a limit. So what can attackers do? So a majority attacker can solve computational puzzles faster in expectation uh, than the honest minority, which means that the, the, a majority attacker can create a alternative long chain uh, alternative longest chain that they were, and they replace the honest chain at a strategically opportune moment, uh, which allows the attacker to control what transactions get added to the blockchain, remove recent transactions from the blockchain, earn block rewards for uh, for this attack for each period of their alternative chain. But what a majority attacker can't do is just steal all the Bitcoin. So create new transactions that spend other people's Bitcoins. This requires uh, not just a majority, but for breaking modern cryptography. I would need to know Nicholas's uh, password, essentially, you know, his private key um, to, to spend his Bitcoins. So the, the canonical attack to worry about is called double spending, where I do the following three things in order. I'll give you a graphic of this in, on the next slide. First, I spend some Bitcoin. So I send a million dollars worth of Bitcoins to Goldman Sachs or to Coinbase or whomever. Um, uh, maybe it's a billion dollars and then they send me um, uh, in, in exchange for goods or assets. Uh, I allow that transaction to be added to the blockchain. Um, and then I subsequently remove that transaction from the blockchain, maybe after an escrow period so I send the billion dollars worth of Bitcoin to Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs sends me a billion dollars worth of treasury bonds or gold or, or, or dollars or whatever. And then I remove the transaction from the blockchain in which I sent the billion dollars worth of Bitcoin to Goldman. So I now have that. I have both the billion dollars of Bitcoin and the billion dollars of, uh, of, of other uh, financial assets, uh, possibly after an escrow period. All right, so let's, let's look at what that looks like visually. So let's say this is the system before I attack. In this block, I send Bitcoin to, to a bank or to an exchange or whomever. I wait an escrow period. The current escrow period is six blocks or 60 minutes for many kinds of transactions. It's longer or shorter for some kinds of transactions. Um, after this escrow period elapses, the bank or the exchange releases assets to me in exchange for this Bitcoin, which they now they now see like, oh, I, the Bitcoin got, I sent a mil, uh, I, I sent a thousand Bitcoins to Nicholas here, and we've now built six blocks on top of that. So I'm pretty secure that this transaction is an official part of history. But what the attacker's been doing in parallel is mining their own private chain where here they send that same Bitcoin to somebody else, to a cousin account. Um, and because they have more, um, more compute power than the honest miners, so if the honest miners are doing 150 million trillion per second, the attacker is doing 200 million trillion per second, um, the attacker can create a longer chain um, 
and then release this longer chain at an opportune moment after they've gotten the billion dollars of, of, of gold from Goldman Sachs, um, release this chain. Now this is the official longest chain and the official record. And in this official record, the fact that up here, I sent a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin to Goldman Sachs, that's vanished from history. This is now history. And in this history, that billion dollars of Bitcoin got sent to my cousin. Okay, so that's a double spending attack. Let me pause and just see if there are any quest quick clarifying questions on what a double spending attack is. Um, if, yes, so, give it. There, at the moment, there are no questions in the chat, but if there's uh, a question, please just unmute yourself. Let's wait for a few seconds. This is confusing on the one hand, and on the other hand, trust can't come from nowhere. And it's in the Nakamoto ab abstract. I just want to underscore that, that this is the vulnerability of Bitcoin, that if you have more compute power than the honest miners, you can do exactly this kind of double spending attack. This is, I didn't make this up. This is just in, in the abstract. Um, yeah, I'm the first you know, economist to link this to the zero profit condition and then and, and kind of put this into like, okay, let's think about some limits on the system. But I, I genuinely didn't make this up. I just want to be clear on that. I, I do have a question that I want to clarify. Yep. Um, so I, I was, yeah, I thought that after a block, it's kind of released, that become the history. But in this example, it seems that after six blocks are released, then it could actually be replaced by some longer chains of blocks. So, um, yeah, so like, that, yeah. that, so what, what, what the system would see is, so I, I should have underscored the following about the, the Nakamoto invention. This is in the abstract that I read out loud, but I didn't really emphasize it, is that there's also, there's a consensus convention in the, in the Bitcoin system, which is the longest chain is the official record of events. Um, and what that, if you think about it, what that, what that deals with is, you know, what if I solve a block and you solve a block and, so, and somebody else solves a block at about the same time? What's the official record of what happened? Uh, well, we have to we have to deter we have to break ties somehow. And what Nakamoto proposed is that the the, the tie breaking is the longest chain, um, and that what that does is it means that the longest chain proves that the the pro proves that the most computational work was was conducted. Um, so the if, if an attack like, so what happens all the time in, in ordinary course is that I solve a block and you solve a block at about the same time, nothing, no nefarious intent, sort of by coincidence. And then there, that's called a fork. And miners have to decide, do I build off of this one or do I build off of that one? Most forks that happen by coincidence, because you know, there's, there's some latency in the system, if it takes 10 minutes to solve a block and there's one second latency, a fork's about a one in 600 event, and that's about right. Um, most forks get resolved within, within another block or two. So some miners will work on this one, some miners will work on this one, whichever one happens to solve next, that becomes the official record because it's the new, long, the new unambiguous longest chain. And for there to be multiple such coincidences in a row where uh, multiple chains, the next block gets solved at exactly the same second, that becomes increasingly rare. Um, what you'd see here is a, is a funnier look in history. You'd see, oh, there was actually a pretty long chain um, and then a pretty long alternative chain that got released with what to the network looks like some latency. So it's as if like, oh, there must have been a network outage in country A because I'm only seeing this chain with some, with some latency. Um, but you can't, you can't know for sure, like, is that network outage or is that an attack or, or what? Or is it some just astonishing coincidence? So Nakamoto built into his protocol, longest chain, that's the official record of events. I'll, I'll come back on the very last slide to one of the responses I've gotten um, from Bitcoin advocates, which is, oh, well, the community will notice there was an attack and will spontaneously reorganize. Um, and that, that seems like a legitimate response to my paper on the one hand, and on the other hand, it's not anonymous decentralized trust. That's, that's a community of Bitcoin advocates responding to an attacker. Um, so the anonymous decentralized trust as envisioned by Nakamoto is, 
is vulnerable to this, this attack. Um, all right, let me, let me press forward. So I've got about 20 minutes left and I wanna make sure I get through the rest of the paper and then take plenty of questions. Okay, so to translate this attack into values for, for V and alpha, um, let's, let's make some assumptions. I'm gonna put K transactions in a block. Um, this is a bit arbitrary, but I'm gonna have the attacker engage in one block worth of transactions. Um, and the average value of the attacker's transactions, I'm gonna call V upper bar. And I think of V upper bar maybe in combined with K is sort of like a statistic on Bitcoin's economic usefulness. Can I, can I, if I attack the thing, am I getting a thousand bucks at a pop? Am I getting a million bucks at a pop? Am I, am I, is this being used for transfers of 10 millions, tens of millions of dollars of wealth at a pop? Um, so V, V upper bar is like a statistic on Bitcoin's, uh, economic throughput. Um, there's an escrow period of E blocks. Uh, let's assume the attack does not affect the subsequent value of Bitcoins. I'll relax this in a moment. Um, so under these assumptions, that uh, economic limits equation becomes, uh, becomes the following. Little p, the per transaction fee paid to miners has got to be large relative to V upper bar divided by this net cost of attack parameter alpha. Um, so I want to now simulate um, what alpha is, uh, do some computer sim numerical simulations to compute alpha, and that'll teach us what, what level of P we need to secure a given level of, of V. So equivalently, you can think of one over alpha as sort of like the tax rate. Um, that, that, so the, the level al alpha times P has got to be large, larger um, than, uh, than V. Okay. So here's the duration, expected duration of attacks. And let, let's focus on an escrow period of, of six blocks. If I have one and a quarter as much uh, compute power as the honest miners, so I have five ninths of all compute power, it takes me up in about 13 blocks on average to finish the attack. Um, sometimes more, sometimes less, it's stochastic. Um, if the escrow period is much longer, I'm going to want to use a much smaller majority. I can love large numbers kind of works in my favor. And you'll see much longer uh, expected durations. The computational cost of the attack um, is, you know, that how long does the attack take times how much compute power am I using? That's kind of boring. Uh, you then can subtract out the number of block rewards I earn from the attack from the expected compute cost, and you get um, numbers, this, this wall of numbers for uh, alpha as a function of the escrow period and the com computational majority I'm using. So let me just focus your attention here. If the escrow period is six blocks and I have a five ninths majority, alpha is about three. And this is like a one third tax on the largest transactions in the system. So if, if I can, if the attacker can do V upper bar size transactions, um, the, the per transaction fee has got to be at least a third of that uh, to not incentivize such an attack. So it's like a 33% tax on the largest transactions in the system. Um, so this is, this is just repeating, repeating myself. So alpha of about, about three, uh, longer escrow periods, you get alpha up to about 50. If, if the escrow, this is like an escrow period of a week. Um, and this is like, you could think of this, these as like large taxes. So alpha of 1.6 is like a one over alpha of six or 60% tax. Um, so if, if an attacker can do million dollar transactions, which is if, if Bitcoin becomes a big part of the financial system, doing million dollar transactions will become trivial. You would need a, a per transaction fee um, that seems implausibly large to secure the system against an attack. Um, um, I'm gonna skip that. This is some new work I've been work doing lately. Um, make sure you give this the proposition and then um, and then mostly skip it. So the, the approach I've reported gives the attacker uh, T block rewards, even if the attackers solve more blocks than that. So if I have a massive majority and the escrow period is six, then on average, the attacker will have solved 35 blocks by the time the honest miners have reached the end of the escrow period of one plus E. Um, but my current simulation is only giving the attacker credit for 
the amount of blocks the honest miners have solved plus one. The attacker is essentially keeping all the other blocks in reserve. If you give the attacker block rewards for all of the blocks solved in the attack, uh, not just those needed to outpace the honest chain, and the attacker's compute costs are the same as the honest miners, and, and, and the attack doesn't cause subsequent decline, then the net cost of the attack is actually zero. Um, and the intuition is the honest miners are, get, are breaking even at n star c equals p. Um, the attacker is solving a blocks per unit time at cost a times n star c. So the attacker breaks even two. Um, and this is something Jacob Leshno first pointed out to me in the context uh, of the model in my uh, June 2018 drafts. So I'll credit to Jacob for that. Um, so here's an alternative. Let me, let me skip this just in the interest of time. So I have about 10 minutes left. Um, but you get, get to kind of similar magnitudes. Um, so, some takeaways from the double spending simulations. So it seems consistent with some modest early use cases of Bitcoin, like Silk Road or online gambling, a thousand bucks for drugs on the dark web, that kind of thing. It seems consistent with some larger scale black market uses of Bitcoin, because those users are going to be willing to pay the really high costs. But it casts doubt on Bitcoin as a major component of the mainstream global financial system. It's just too, too expensive as a form of trust. Uh, and again, for the system to be secure for large transactions requires implicit tax rates that are large on the big transactions, but make it unusable for small transactions. Um, and, and a surprise to the computer science community is that the escrow period isn't, isn't more protective. So alpha doesn't grow dramatically with the escrow period E. And the, the intuition is the attacker's getting paid for the attack, they're earning their block rewards. Uh, so an obvious response, this, this came up in some of the questions, is that the double spending would be noticed, but you know, the Bitcoin, Bitcoin users would see like, oh, there's two large chains, one of which is six blocks, one of which is eight blocks, something funny is going on. Um, if you, the, and the Bitcoin community, or Bitcoin wiki classifies the majority attack as probably not a problem for this reason. So suppose formally that the attack causes Bitcoin's value to decline by some proportion, I'll call it delta attack. Um, this changes the constraint from before um, to on the left is the, the value per block, uh, the, the fee per, per, per transaction. On the right is the same V upper bar, how big are the tr largest possible transactions. But now you see this delta attack thing in the math. And if delta attack is large enough, if delta attack goes to one, so the value falls by proportion 100%, this thing's going to zero, so the equation will be satisfied. So if delta attack's large enough, then you do indeed deter double spending. The new intuition is why send a billion dollars to Goldman Sachs to get back both a billion dollars of gold and a billion dollars of Bitcoin if the billion dollars of Bitcoin then goes to zero. I'm not gonna, that's not gonna be a incentive compatible attack. Uh, but this is a bit of a pick your poison argument because it's conceding that a, a double spending attack will cause the value of a trillion dollar market cap asset uh, to fall. Um, so then you have to worry about an attacker motivated by the, the sabotage per se, and I'll call that uh, V sabotage. Um, so again, either high implicit tax rates or you have to concede uh, vulnerability to outright collapse. All right, so last, last part of the, the talk is the reason why I think Bitcoin hasn't been attacked yet um, is this, this uh, combination of the sabotage issue and the specific technology. Um, so, so far I've assumed that the attacker's cost is a flow cost, this little C guy. Um, but if, if the technology is specific, so it's not repurposable technology that you can rent. And the attack causes the whole thing to collapse. So now I have this specific technology that's useless. Um, that makes attacking more expensive. It makes it more appropriate to charge the attacker a stock cost rather than a flow cost. Um, and these both seem true at the moment. So the, both, 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 um, both condition one and condition two seem likely to hold for Bitcoin at the moment, even though it's not what was envisioned by Nakamoto. Um, so the, the flow cost approach I've used so far is appropriate under a bunch of cases. So if the most efficient chips are repurposable, if the most efficient chips are specialized, but repurposable chips are close enough, I'll go through this quickly. 
um, if the most efficient chips are specialized, but there's, you know, there's kind of a glut of previous generation chips that you can use for the attack. Um, or if the attack isn't a sabotage, you use the specialized chips, but you can attack, do the, do the billion dollars of double spending against Goldman Sachs, and then just keep, keep mining as usual because you haven't sabotaged anything. Um, but the flow cost approach is not appropriate in what I'll call case five, um, which is that the most efficient chips are specialized. There aren't good substitutes. So there aren't repurposable chips that are anywhere close or, or a glut of earlier specialized chips that are anywhere close. And then attack would cause the system to collapse. Um, so if all of these conditions are true, then you got to charge the attacker a, a stock cost, not a flow cost. Um, and here, by the way, this is what I mean by specialized technology. Um, this is an ant miner uh, uh, Bitcoin mining rig. It costs about four grand a machine. It does 110 uh, trillion uh, hashes per second. So you would need about a thousand, uh, sorry, about a million of these machines, you know, one point something million of these machines to match the current Bitcoin hash rate of 150 million trillion hashes per second. So about $5 billion worth of this capital to, uh, to, attack, um, to attack the Bitcoin blockchain. Whereas if you, if, you, you, if you could get access to all of Amazon web services, so if you could rent, this is kind of remarkable, if you could, rent, if you could just temporarily divert all of AWS to Bitcoin mining, you'd have about 1% of the total hash rate. I mean, this, the specialized technology is just so much more powerful than non-specialized uh, specialized technology. Um, Okay, so, so in this fifth case, let's assume that the, the case, let's, let's consider the case of total collapse, uh, including the specialized equipment. Now you lose the, you, you incur the cost of the attack and you also lose the value of, of your specialized capital. So in effect, the, the cost of the attack is the $5 billion of specialized equipment. Whereas earlier, the cost of the attack was, um, in measured in units of $400,000 per block. So like well under $10 million, even for, for large escrow periods. So the, val the cost of an attack given the specialized equipment plus sabotage is billions, not millions. Um, we still have kind of the pick your poison issue, which is you to get to this, this constraint, uh, you have to concede um, the possibility of, of uh, sabotaging collapse. Um, and these amounts are still kind of small. $5 billion is more than I can fund, but like Elon Musk could fund it. Um, and if Bitcoin becomes the, the major component of the global financial system that its advocates fantasize about, it's a, still a pretty small amount of money. I mean, the, attacking the Bitcoin blockchain is a lot cheaper than attacking the Federal Reserve or Fort Knox. Um, so some collapse scenarios. So let's suppose for the purpose of discussion um, that the Bitcoin blockchain fails what uh, the second, the, the, the initial incentive compatibility condition. So it fails this condition here, alpha times n star little c, the flow cost, that you actually would want to attack if you could just rent the 400,000 bucks worth of equipment, $400,000 of flow cost per 10 minutes. If you could rent that, you would want to attack the thing, which I think seems true. Like if you could, if you could attack the Bitcoin blockchain for a few millions of dollars, like you could, you could make off like a bandit these days. Um, but let's assume it doesn't satisfy, uh, sorry, it, the, the, it does satisfy the incentive, the second incentive condition, which is you wouldn't want to spend $5 billion to attack the thing. The model then suggests three things that could change that could precipitate, um, precipitate collapse. So one is if the chips become cheap enough um, and then you get into flow cost, not stock cost. So you go back to equation two, not two prime. Um, or similarly, if Bitcoin becomes just cheap enough, that creates a glut of chips. Um, two is if, if repurposable chips get good enough. So this would be like um, dream versions or fantasy versions of F FPGA chips, like flexible, uh, flexible reprogrammable chips. Or third, if just the sabotage becomes tempting enough to induce the $5 billion. Um, so that could be a futures markets continue to grow or Bitcoin becomes more economically important than it currently is. 51% um, attacks have happened in a lot of other cryptocurrencies, not Bitcoin, not a, the main Ethereum, yes, and the sort of offshoot of Ethereum, uh, yes, and an offshoot of Bitcoin called Bitcoin Gold. 
but 51% attacks aren't pure theory. They're, 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 they happen in reality just that for the smaller coins with less compute power behind them. Uh, the Bitcoin gold one is a kind of a particularly interesting case study, but let me skip it in the interest of time. Uh, all right, so just to summarize, so the anonymous decentralized trust enabled by, by Nakamoto's blockchain, I think it's ingenious, but it's in intrinsically very expensive. Uh, for the trust to be meaningful, the flow cost of maintaining the blockchain has got to be large relative to the value of attacking it. Uh, so this means that if you want to prevent double spending, you've got to pay miners a large amount relative to the highest value uses of, of Bitcoin, which is like a large tax. And then to get out, get out of this argument, to get that the attack costs more than this flow costs requires two major concessions. First, that your, the security relies on these, these specialized chips. And then second, that the system's vulnerable to, to sabotage and collapse. So for that reason, I call it the pick your poison argument. You either have to concede really high costs or you have to concede vulnerability uh, to, to collapse. Um, so the overall message is that it just seems like there's intrinsic economic limits to how important Bitcoin can become. If it gets important enough, it will, it will get attacked. Um, I wanna emphasize the models consistent with both early uses of Bitcoin um, and with black market uses of Bitcoin. The black market users are gonna be willing to pay uh, high implicit fees. I'm more skeptical of mainstream financial system uses of Bitcoin. Uh, so becoming a major component of the global financial system. I also want to emphasize I'm not skeptical of, of blockchain in that broader distributed database sense of the term. Um, what I'm highlighting actually is that it's exactly what's novel about Nakamoto relative to traditional distributed databases, you know, the anonymous decentralized trust that Nakamoto invented that makes it so uh, economically limited. Um, a few open questions, so I'll skip through this just in the interest of time. But one is, are there other ways to generate anonymous decentralized trust that get around this paper's arguments? So one, one interesting idea in this regard is proof of stake. Um, my paper conjecture, and then Joshua Gans and Neil Gandahl prove quite, you know, prove rigorously that proof of stake goes through, this you know, is vulnerable to the same argument as, uh, as proof of work. And basically just conceptualize C is the per block opportunity cost of holding a unit of stake and all the arguments uh, go through. But stakes might create new possibilities for thwarting attacks because stake has some memory and work, work intrinsically is memoryless. So we'll see, we'll see if there's a break. There's been a lot of work by computer scientists and practitioners on, on these kinds of ideas. Um, a second question for economists is, computer scientists seem unimpressed with the idea of a, a quote, private blockchain or distributed ledger you quote, just a database. But I think an open question is whether there's anything economically interesting that emerges from this particular form of database. Um, and then, as I mentioned at the outset, there's been a lot of responses to this draft, especially from, from Bitcoin uh, programmers and advocates um, and uh, cryptocurrency pro uh, advocates. So proof of stake I just mentioned. Um, Many Bitcoin believers have said, well, what about rule of law as a response to your, your argument? Well, you know, make a double, you know, if, if, if law enforcement um, prevents double spending attacks, uh, and that's like sort of ironic <laughs> as a response to my paper. The whole point was the anonymous decentralized trust. So now, now that it's grown to hundreds of billions or even a trillion of market cap, now let's bring in rule of law. Exchanges are also sort of ironic they provide trust, but you're again, trust in Coinbase instead of trust in the traditional financial system. I don't quite get that. Um, there's an interesting argument by Moroz et al. Um, that you can deter attack with a particularly elaborate form of double spending counterattack. So I, I attack you, you attack me back. And sort of reminds me of a wild west in which everyone's packing heat. And so it, the argument makes sense, but it's, it doesn't seem like a, a vision of the future financial system. And then last, you know, the community will notice an attack and respond. But again, that's also not anonymous and decentralized. Um, so I, th I think the argument stands, I'm a trillion dollar, I'm, I haven't, I'm, I'm neither long nor short cryptocurrencies. I don't have a, any financial interest in this stuff. I guess I have an intellectual interest at this point. Let me pause there. I think I'm out of time. I'm happy to stay online for, for questions and comments uh, as long as you've got them. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Eric. Um, 
as I said, the official time is now up, but we can continue our discussion afterwards. Uh, let me make first uh, a quick announcement. So first of all, thanks a lot for, for this, this great talk. I've learned a lot about the blockchain and, and the costs of, of trust. A second, I want to tell you about our next talk in two weeks time. Then Julian Combe will talk about uh, unpaired kidney exchange. So all of you who want to stay, just stay in this room and uh, we will continue our discussion. So if you have any questions, just unmute yourself. I would have a quick question, uh, dear Eric. Um, thank you so much right. for, for the talk. Um, and my question is actually, because um, I mean, criminals use Bitcoins. So there, there seems to be some evidence on that. Um, now, as, um, as this may become economically a bit more important and it may become more costly to keep it alive, uh, would you somehow predict that the fraction of users who are uh, illegally using it um, will um, increase? Yeah, at the moment, um, I think a great question. I think at, at the moment, the a, a lot of the transaction volume in Bitcoin looks speculative. And then the one source of use that you see doc discussed a lot is essentially various forms of black market transactions. So moving, moving money around the world in a way that isn't detectable by um, uh, traditional regulatory authorities. So I, I, th I think what, I, I, at some basic level, I, I think Bitcoin is useful for black market transactions because it's an expensive form of trust. But if you're doing black market transactions, you might be willing to pay a large amount for, for that expensive form of trust, um, precisely because you're trying to evade, evade the law. Um, the, the large speculative component to current Bitcoin volumes, I don't understand as well, though. You know, we don't understand a lot of things about. Um, and Bitcoins, by the way, it's a bubble whether it works or it doesn't, right? Because it's either a bubble in this sense, or it's a bubble in this sense, right? If it if it becomes a, if it stays permanently worth a trillion dollars or more, that's also a bubble in the sense that currencies are bubbles. If it goes up to a trillion dollars and back down to zero. That's clearly a bubble, uh, or I, I, sorry, I shouldn't say clearly a bubble. Gene Fama will will correct <laughs> correct the record, but it's bubbleish. You know, economists don't understand bubbles that well, but I think you I think the black market use cases are are compelling, and that's where there might be a willingness to pay really high implicit fees. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. So. Um... So in the talk, um, you, you assume P, the prices is fixed, but um, I, I would imagine that the prices could be, you know, determined by equilibrium. Where you know, if people think that it's it's going to be a tech, then price would decrease, mm -hmm. and if you know, if they think it's safe, then you increase. So it might be that the price would decrease in such a point that um, a tech would no longer be profitable. Dan, yeah, I, was, I think it's yeah. really hard to get a model with um, with price formation in it. Basically, I, do, yeah. I, 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 I get I get the question. I think it's just genuinely hard to have any um, equilibrium mo model of, of the Bitcoin price. But yeah. I think you're right that like if it does seem like a little bit multiple equilibria, where if 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 there becomes a widespread expectation that Bitcoin will get attacked and collapse, then it, its value should, you know, value might be self-fulfilling. Um, so it yes. sort of seems like something out of equilibrium about my argument. But I think thinking that Bitcoin's out of equilibrium doesn't strike me as a, an outrageous uh, yeah. position to take. It doesn't, I mean, it's, a, it's, a no, it's a very novel thing, right? It's where the world's trying to figure out what its role is in equilibrium. Uh, yeah. Then I, I I'm kind of struggling to to understand what's the kind of definition of Bitcoin not being able to become an important role of the financial system. If you define it as the as the vulnerability of a tech, and if the equilibrium prices would adjust itself in a way that it's it's not subject to a tech, then 
yeah. So uh, then, how how do we understand mm -hmm. the concept of not being able or being able to become an important part of the financial system? Yeah, I think I think you're right in the sense that if the trillion dollars is a um, some kind of rational expectations price of Bitcoin, then it's hard to see. It's hard to make sense of it's then I either that points to my arguments wrong or the value of, of black market uses of Bitcoin is much higher than is appreciated. Um, uh, alternatively, the, the price is in irrational expectations equilibrium. Well, although I actually let me let me strike that because I, I, I don't I don't want to have to take a view on what the Bitcoin price is. I feel like that's I think what would falsify this paper is if Bitcoin starts to be used as a meaningful part of the global payment system. So if we start to see um, movements of um, millions or tens of millions of dollars of you know, Bitcoin for other kinds of financial assets, not through Coinbase, <laughs> but but in the with, which has really high fees, by the way. I mean, Coinbase is a great business. They're about to go public at also $100 billion. Mm -hmm. um, but if we start to see uses of Bitcoin in large scale in the Nakamoto envision sense, if I directly transact Bitcoin for, for financial assets, not through a rule of law protected intermediary, I think that at some point I got to give up the ghost and say, okay, this argument's wrong. But we haven't seen that. Like we, what we're seeing is... Um, uh, what we're seeing is speculation, speculative trading, and, and probably black market use. Uh, but I'm, you know, I'm open-minded. I show me the data. Yeah. Go, any uh, any more questions? Um, do we see more use of Bitcoin in countries that sort of have lower general institutional trust? If this is about trust, um, do we see a relationship there? It's a great question. I, I haven't seen data myself on that. Um, in, it sounds very, very plausible. Um, a lot of Bitcoin believers will, will uh, it's hard to go more than a few minutes without hearing Venezuela invoked. And I think that that's meant to signify, like if you have a, a failed state, um, the value of a currency that evades state control um, is that, that's a, that becomes like a form of black market use, just black market relative to a failed state. So outside of that state, you might think of it as not black market. You might think of that as you know legitimate form of transaction. Um, so that 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 hypothesis makes a lot of sense. I just haven't seen seen data that speaks to it. Perfect. If there are no question, can I ask one more? Yeah, if I were. <laughs> yeah, I, I might have missed that, but um, um, how does the, I imagine that if N increases, if the number of users in the, or number of miners in the, you know, in the world increases, mm -hmm. it will become harder to attack. Yes. So, is it, so that, that's true as well, I see. Yeah, that's true. So in, in the, I have a slide, a backup slide that I can, I don't need to, let me just, let me bring it up. Yeah. That's okay. Um, well, I, I, well, I don't need to, I'll, I'll just read, read the, the data from it. So currently the Bitcoin hash rate is about 150 million trillion hashes per second. Um, the, you know, as recently as in the last run up in 2018, it was more like 50 million trillion. And then before ASICs got really good, you know, it was a tiny fraction of that. So in 2017 or so, or 2016, it was, you know, significantly less than 10 million trillion hashes per second. That's still, you know, that, um, so the hash rate keeps going up. There, there's been some work, uh, I think Julian Pratt's got a, I think that's the right reference, a paper on kind of the economics of the Bitcoin mining market, where it does seem like it's got behavior that has the flavor of both free entry and SS where if the price gets high enough, you pay more fixed cost. If the price gets low enough, you take some capacity offline. So it has the kind of has the free entry of micro and the SS model of macro all combined with you know, the institutional details of Bitcoin. So that, 
I don't know if that paper is published yet, but yeah, Julian Pratt was working on that. He presented it at a conference at Chicago a few years ago. Um, but yeah, the more, the higher is P block, the more secure the system is, but that's, that's a fee. That's like a fee per transaction on using the system. So, so if that's, a, yeah. that sort of comes back to the black market comment, which is if it's useful enough, the way it can get used is there could be a high P block coming from whether it's the block rewards or just transaction fees. Uh, and that, that's what will make the system robust to attack. Um, yeah, I, I, I find it very interesting because uh, in the last comment that you make about the specificity of, of the machine, it seems to be that if the cost is lower and more people get into the mining business, then actually it also makes the, it will make the, uh, the system more secure. But at the same time, the non if it becomes cheaper, then, you know, it's, then it becomes actually more attractive to attack um, the system. So yeah. there's a... You know, yeah, I think the, crit the critical variable that I think my paper highlights is it's not quite, you know, is, is mining here versus here, but it's is the economics of the mining making the cost of attack lower stock. And right now the cost of attack will be like a stock because the, the equipment's very specific, hard to rent. Um, and if, I mean, the, if you have a trillion dollar asset that's premised on cryptographically provided security and then it gets double spended and it's on the front page of the Wall Street Journal and the FT and all, every other publication, you know, a lot of large institutional investors are going to start to have second thoughts. Be like, wait, what? I, I, when I've presented this work um, um, you know, with financial, to financial market regulators, you, know, you can kind of tell uh, sometimes it's the first they've really thought about the double spending attack. And I'll say like, it's in the abstract of the Nakamoto paper. This is the issue that he was trying to solve. But I think there's a, a confusion in a lot of the public discussion of Bitcoin where people think the cryptography makes it fully secure and they forget that actually it's vulnerable to a 51% attack. And there's some simple economics for how to think about what would induce the 51% attack. But we'll see. I don't know if I'm looking smart or stupid so far. I mean, it's been, been a few years. You can, I, mean, I, I think I look smart on some of my other work. If, if, if on this work, I look stupid, you know, it's a, I'll take it, it's fine. <laughs> um, but uh, any, any, last, uh, any last questions before I get too introspective and end up on the therapist's couch? Let's, uh, we should break this thing. All right, well, th thank, thank you all very much. And, and thanks again to the organizers for doing this. It's really great. It's a nice institution. It's, it's really great that uh, um, it's a, 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 silver, a silver lining of the last year is getting to do stuff like this. I really appreciate the invitation. <laughs>